this computer. Okay, cool. All right, um, if anyone has any questions, comments, anything else, feel free to throw them into the chat. I'm gonna kick things off uh, by just pointing you guys to where all this uh, information and stuff is. Uh, today we're doing gradient descent. So I understand you guys covered this on the Tuesday lecture. Um, really, that's probably gonna be the the concept I'll focus the most on in this tutorial, uh, and like we'll build out in a notebook, um, and I'll point you guys to them. Please see about like spinning these up yourself. Uh, and with a bit more time, there's like a very short one on data imputation, just like how do you fill in missing values using others. If we have enough time, I'll uh, I'll cover that one as well. Uh, but yeah. Without further ado, I'll start things off as I normally do with a uh, brief presentation, um, some ML Weekly stuff. So uh, again, just a disclaimer, I'm putting these all publicly online. So uh, for privacy preserving reasons, um, either ask your questions in the chat, keep, the, keep your video off. Um, and if there's any issues with this at all, just let me or Professor Green know. And I'll kick things off with the ML Weekly stuff, so fun updates, and some of them are a bit more relevant to this gradient uh, descent stuff. Um, in particular, so this is not something that's necessarily new, but something I think uh, you, as all uh, students learning to uh, kind of familiarize yourselves with concepts in, uh, in machine learning, this is an excellent journal. It's, I think, started off by uh, basically a group from Google Brain, Google AI, OpenAI, um, and a few other um, machine learning research researchers in, in a given community. Um, the distilled journal basically is like the gold standard, I think, that, uh, that documents should be to understand really what's going on in a given um, machine learning algorithm. So they, they cover some really, really interesting um, topics, and these are all like highly um, interactive notebooks. So one that I'll bring up in particular, because I'll mention it a bit later when we're talking about gradient descent, is this one on momentum by Gabriel Go. Um, really a phenomenal piece. So the idea is that we're, we're trying to figure out how different, um, different parameters in a learning algorithm will uh, affect your ability to converge to a solution. And so we're covering gradient descent today, but another one is momentum. And so if you want to kind of play around with uh, different concepts and like have them live <laughs> updated in uh, in the um, in the browser, uh, you can you can basically play around with this and it like kind of walks you through some of the math, what like the concept of momentum is, um, introduces things like eigenvalues and stuff, and and they're all um, created in such a way that you can like really build up an intuition. Like this is something that I think is really key to. Um, to, uh, to machine learning is really understanding intuitively, not just mathematically, but intuitively what's going on in, in these types of things, and like how uh, different things in combination uh, produce the models that we end up with uh, at the end. So anyways, this is just uh, a really phenomenal one to, to play around with, and there's, there's a ton other. I'll, you'll definitely see more of, uh, of these in the future when we start covering things like CNNs and whatnot to get a good idea as to like what's really going on um, within a given model in a CNN. Um, so that's uh, distilled from the NLP um, kind of side of things. I'm gonna introduce, uh, this is a paper that's relatively new as well, so concept movers distance. So we can take uh, words and we can cast them into like a high dimensional, higher dimensional space where we can then actually like measure how close any two uh, words are together. So something like Obama, so this is just like a 2D perhaps like projection representation of what that higher dimensionality space is. So it's just a simulation. But a given document that has the words Obama speaks to the media in Illinois, the word Obama would in this case conceptually be uh, closer in this higher dimensional space to the, to the concept of president, just like speaking is similar to greeting. Illinois is um, similar to Chicago, press to media. So if we have one document or, or statement that says Obama speaks to the media in Illinois and the president greets the press in Chicago, um, the concept movers distance really tries to measure how close uh, those things are to like other pseudo concepts. So in this case, if you think of like music, 
we want a smaller distance between the band gave a concert in Japan because that's conceptually closer than Obama speaks to the media in Illinois. So each of, each of these words has a certain distance to the concept of music and in combination we get um, kind of like a measurement of a given document to uh, that, uh, that concept. So um, really powerful in a few different ways, something that I'm looking, uh, so it's, it's out of, um, it was first, uh, introduced in the archive variant of social psychology, so SOC archive. Um, and this is really new as a concept. It's like still being developed. So something something for those with an NLP pension to, to maybe keep an eye out for. Uh, and this one's a really fun one. So uh, I, I'm like, I think about five days ago, Google launched an AI lip sync challenge. So um, basically, uh, yeah, basically they're, they're trying to train um, so like using facial features, they're trying to uh, train, I guess, an AI or uh, or otherwise to be able to lip sync to a given song and they need training data for that. So they're basically creating this as kind of like a, a game for people to uh, to basically uh, link, lip sync along with a given song so that their model can get better and you can do this and play with it yourself. Yeah, another way for Google to steal your face, yes, uh, in the chats, but... Um, they do say as part of their um, as part of their uh, usage policy, they they don't actually keep any of your facial recognition info. They they just want the landmarks from your face. So um, I tried it. I got uh, three stars out of five. I challenge every one of you to um, try and beat that if if you want. If it, it seems, I, I did this a few times. It seems the more like expressive you are in your lip syncing and like how much your face moves you tend to do a bit better, but uh, yeah, I was not the best lip syncer. All to say, um, I'm going to now put this into full screen mode. So I'm gonna hopefully build up a bit of an intuition for, uh, I was having a hard time with this. Let's go full screen mode. So um, uh, I'm go I always like to build up a bit of an intuition before we jump into things. So you guys might've already seen uh, like a lot of this or like um, heard a lot of this on the Tuesday lecture. Um, but I'm just going to kind of like do this as a as a as a primer. So we have a continuous function in a given space where any given x value is a point along that continuous line, um, as opposed to a discontinuous one. So a discontinuous one may have like breaks uh, where it's not defined within a given domain within the range or like points of like uh, discontinuity. Um, it's critical for what we're looking at that. Um, that we in fact consider a, uh, a continuous domain because we can't have, for the algorithms we develop, we can't uh, you know, um, have these, these uh, undefined or, or breaks in a given curve. Um, and what we all know from kind of entry level calculus and, and the likes, uh, different curves can have local maxima, they can have uh, local minima. Um, in this case, this one shoots down to infinity and uh, to the to the left and up to or down to negative infinity and, and positive infinity in this case. Um, in most of what we're looking for, we want to find a global um, minimum. Um, in this case, this this curve isn't exactly one that uh, um, would be uh, necessarily useful for our purposes, but I'm, I just wanted to illustrate it on something that kind of has, uh, you know, the, the basic features of a generic or arbitrary curve. And so the task of gradient descent is, let's assume that we have this kind of like starting point. So this curve here is um, perhaps an error curve. What we want to do is we want to minimize the error of our model. And the thing is, at a given, with a given set of parameters, um, we want to kind of like tune those parameters in such a way that we can find our way to a minimum. And that minimum would then be like the minimized uh, error for our given model. So how do you tweak those parameters? How do you, how do you, um, kind of like adapt them in such a way that we get our model to be better and better. So we pose this then as uh, somewhat of an optimization problem. So we want to find the value of x that mi minimizes this function, f of x, which is um, in this case our, or in, in a case can be the, the error function. Um, the like analogy here though, is that we don't know uh, what this curve or what the space around it necessarily looks like. We don't know what direction how do we modify those parameters? What direction do we go to? How much should we move into that direction? Like it's, it's basically posed as a search problem. And the analogy here is usually like you're a, you're a, a climber or like a hiker on a mountain. You don't have a map. You don't know the terrain around you, but you need to get down. So, or you need to get to like the bottom of that hill. So what you want to do is where you are now, you'll find, you know, where is the, 
kind of path of uh, fastest or steepest descent, and then you start going there. And then if you take a few steps forward or like one step forward, you reevaluate where in the terrain is the point of fastest descent and let me now go, go that way. And you can also do it the opposite way, right? If you want to get to the top of the mountain, um, you might just, instead of uh, trying to find the path of steepest descent, you do the path, path of steepest ascent. Um, so it's like you're kind of in the unknown, but you're using local information around you or like and your current position to figure out what to do next. And so that in, uh, is posed then as in the algorithm of greatest gradient descent as, uh, as we know, if we can take the gradient of that function or, the, or we take the derivative of that function, it will inform us of the direction of steepest descent. Um, and then this is the um, a parameter called eta, uh, it's a, or a Greek symbol. It's your kind of step size or your um, learning rate. And what we can do is we can take a step in that direction, like of arbitrary length, um, but in some cases, if we take a step that's too large, we might in fact overshoot that local minimum, right? So we're taking a really large step in the direction of that gradient. Uh, we've kind of overshot, um, as opposed, or conversely, we can take a very small step. So here, just like with another value of eta prime, we can take this like very small incremental step in that direction. Um, and if we do this repeatedly, you can imagine that it will take you know a, quite a bit of time or quite a few iterations to finally get to that local minimum. Um, so in this case, we just take um, a given step. We again reevaluate. So we redefine, or we, um, we take the derivative of that. The derivative is the same, but we we just reevaluate at that new point, and then we continue to take steps. Oops, well, I guess it skips one, but um, we take steps until we get very close to that minimum point, right? And we get to a point where um, basically we have to have converged to within acceptable limits. If this is a continuous space and we just do this forever, um, it's not necessarily, uh, it, like it'll never actually like fully converge. So there's a certain like level of precision as like a stopping criteria to say, given where we were in the last point and we've moved incrementally again, um, by a, like a negligible amount, we, we can call that done. We can call that converged. So um, basically, in as part of the first um, notebook, we'll basically implement batch gradient descent as well as stochastic gradient descent. And the key takeaway here is that basically gradient descent is just a broadly used machine learning, uh, broadly used in machine learning algorithms to basically learn the parameters. Um, this is like a bit of a meme. So uh, depending on how you parameterize your gradient descent, you can get stuck in local minima. Like the idea is we want to find the global minimum of, uh, of the curve, because if that's where error is minimized, we want to have the lowest one and not kind of get trapped in these like little, little valleys. And again, we don't know what the, um, what that uh, like terrain looks like. So we just hope that we can set up gradient descent in such a way that it can have its best possible chance to, to minimize that error. So no questions yet. Um, these are the notebooks we'll cover. So again, I'd, I'd suggest um, just spinning them up and I'll pull them up now. Uh, I'm gonna close these because I don't need them and start here. So gradient descent um, in this notebook, uh, this is kind of like the math that uh, is introduced in the 100 page uh, machine learning like textbook. So, so as I, I kind of um, alluded to, we want to, uh, to find the local minimum, we want to take steps in the direction of the negative gradient. Um, this is like a bit of pseudocode, so we just want to iterate a number of times. So for a given step, we want to, for the gradient of our function, we evaluate it at our current step, and then we set up our next step as whatever the current or the next step will be the current step plus in this case it's a it's an alpha but this is like your your pram or your um your learning rate so we just want to multiply that by the direction of the the gradient and that will tell us where to go for our next x so we'll just do this in like maybe a bit more of a visual manner so here's a uh, a function that we will um set up so uh, x cubed minus 2x squared plus 2. We know what this function is and it's we can get its derivative. All this stuff here is uh, kind of just like plotting, like uh, they're like a bunch of helper functions so that uh, the plotting later on will look really nice. Um, but yeah, 
here what we'll do is we set up basically that function. So we set f to, this is a lambda function where we have x cubed minus 2x squared plus 2. And because we know what that function is, in this case, we can uh, set up the derivative of, of it as well. So this is, this is one way to set it up. One thing, if you want to experiment with um, kind of like different functions and different derivatives, um, I mean, it's a good practice to continuously uh, rederive these things yourself. But then there's also this uh, SymPy library that's really useful where you can set up a symbolic x. So like the x in this case, um, if we want to uh, like automatically derive these functions, I can set up the function instead this way um, and then just have it uh, differentiate it for myself. So I only have to kind of set this up and then let uh, sim the SymPy library uh, get the derivative for me. And then it has this uh, function lambda phi, which basically turns that into lambdas, kind of like what we've done here. It basically just gets rid of the step, the step of you yourself having to do this. So you can kind of rapidly swap out different kind of uh, curves and equations, um, and it will set it up for you. Um, so if we want to plot this and see what it looks like, my intuition initial slides roughly followed from this example. Um, the way that we first start implementing gradient descent, we start with like a few different values. So um, we just set x old to, to zero. It's like kind of like the, it will be the, the previous value. X new will be like our new value. So in the case of like starting, we're just going to set that to um, x equals two. So the point like here on the curve. And then we set up different values for, in this case, step size. This precision value is that threshold. So how, um, as soon as the difference between my old like my previous step and where I am now is smaller than this uh, precision threshold, then we, we stop. We say that it's converged. So if I make this like very, very small, um, you can imagine it will go, uh, you will have to take many, many more iterations to get to that level of precision. Um, and then this is just a visualization uh, value that I've thrown in. So I've um, I set this up so that we can kind of incrementally see how um, everything works. So this is just like a, a one second time in between. And so we're going to keep track of um, the x values that we consider. We're going to keep track of the y values that we consider. Um, and so here's where we basically start. So the, the gradient descent algorithm is kind of implemented here. This stuff at the front is stuff I put in to make for this like really neat kind of like visualization tactic. So um, in notebooks, usually whenever you print something out or display something, it, it will be stacked. Um, so let me just go back up here. So if you import this, from IPython display this clear output, it will like refresh whenever you call this command. So it makes for a very uh, convenient way to visualize things and you'll see why that's the case uh, very soon. But yeah, basically the stuff is, is kind of not necessary. This is where um, all the good stuff happens. We basically um, save our, whatever our current point is to the, the old point, we apply take the uh, previous point where we were and we, and we uh, put it into the, the derivative that gives us this like S sub K. And then this is where we're just defining based on that equation, the new value from it. And then we're just appending this uh, to those lists so that we could plot them. So what that looks like, that's, so this is the effect of the clearing the output. So for a given iteration, this is the X value we're considering. And this is the difference between, um, where that uh, our new value is with respect to the old value. And we're plotting three things here. Basically the full curve, we're zooming in slightly into a subregion of it, and then we're zooming in like quite a bit more. Um, and so what we get here is your local minima occurs at one point. So we, we hit that stopping criteria. We print out the results from this. It took, took us 17 steps. Um, so just like one more time for the sake. So we, like, we started here on step one, we went down, went down again. So we're slowly converging towards this point, taking those incremental steps along the way. And then this very, very zoomed one, like this is like very like locally closed in. So you can see only after a couple steps, like 10 steps, we see it finally showing in. We can see it's like really honing in around this point. And you can see it's only once this difference value. So like this is the last difference value. Um, so in the next iteration, it dropped below that precision value that we cared about. So um, you can obviously play around with uh, the, the function itself. You can play around with some of these parameters. Um, I mean, like one example is what happens if we start way off or uh, let me do one that's 
Well, let's not do it here. Google actually um, set up this really neat uh, little tool to kind of toy around with this stuff as well. So uh, here is just like a parabolic curve. You can set different step sizes and then you can like incrementally iterate and see where things go. Clearly this step size is really, really, really small. So like the number of steps and number of iterations is something that becomes pretty massive. So if we increase the step size, for example, you can see that we take much larger steps, but that eventually we hone in on that. There's a point here. So this model has reached minimal loss. So it's uh, it took 40 steps with a certain learning parameter. And then what happens if that like learning that learning rate is like really large. In this case, we're, we're, we're moving in the direction of the gradient, but we're taking such large steps that we end up um, like even further up the curve on the other side, right? So if we like keep doing this, we're actually not converging, but in fact diverging away from, even though we're moving in the direction of greatest, greatest uh, descent, we're um, kind of like really overshooting that value. So there, there is like a sweet spot here in like the number of, um, steps required to reach that minimum and the size of your of the step. And so again, um, if you want to toy around with like different types of curves and stuff, um, it's basically that. But like it boils down to ultimately this. Like we're just this is your um, well in these three lines, this is your batch gradient descent algorithm. So uh, something. So this is kind of like things I've I've kind of pointed out to. If the steps step size is too small, convergence will be very slow. If it's too large. It may fail to converge at all. In fact, it might, it might diverge, um, or it might like jump over uh, local minima or the global minimum um, in some of those cases. So one way that this can kind of uh, be mediated is you can start with a larger, a larger step size, one that will allow you to kind of explore space a bit faster. But then as iterations go on in like a kind of time-based way, we decay, we shrink down that size. We assume that eventually, as we're continuously moving in the direction of greatest descent, we assume that we're getting closer and closer and closer to uh, that point so we can reduce um, our learning parameter or learning rate, eta, in this way. And there's a number of ways that you can like set up these types of schedulers, uh, some of them being like step-based. So um, you basically just, uh, have it set up as like predefined steps. You can set it also up as exponential as opposed to time. And again, this like more advanced reading. So while um, decay and your learning rate is, is one example, there is another parameter momentum. And that's this uh, distill article uh, here that also will have some effect. And there's a bunch of like ways that it can also vary um, your ability to uh, search for that local or global uh, minimum. And the way that momentum can kind of just be conceptualized is instead of like as an individual taking individual steps in a given direction, momentum is instead like a ball rolling down a hill. So it's uh, if you're at a point of much steeper uh, decline, you might go a lot faster. And as you get closer to um, the ideal point, you want to kind of like slow down that ball, that rolling ball. Um, so anyways, I would highly recommend to those who, who enjoy maybe the more uh, mathy side of things to take the time to kind of like work through these equations. Um, Gabriel Go does a really good job um, in, in really kind of like tying the two together. He does a lot of stuff in like closed form and then tries to uh, tie that to the you know, actual implementation of the algorithms um, and also give like an intuitive sense for how, how these things actually work in a given model. So um, I'd recommend that uh, to those who, who have a bit of time on their hands for reading. But then, uh, okay, so here we're actually going to implement uh, the time-based one. So it's kind of the, the same setup. So uh, X old, X new, um, different step value. Uh, but here we set up two additional parameters. So we're, we're going to track the number of uh, steps that we're on um, and then like a decay value. So by how much we want it to decay for each given step. So again, uh, this is done until the difference between our current point and our old point is, um, is, no, is uh, less than the precision. And we yeah, I set this up more or less the same way. So the only thing that will vary here, we have the same gradient descent setup, but what we're doing is our n, so our eta value here, um, our learning rate, we're, we're simply uh, like reducing it in size as we take greater and greater steps.
So what that looks like in this case um, is something like this, kind of the, the same setup. And we, in this case, I think pretty rapidly. So within six iterations, we've now converged to our given point as opposed to before it was 16. And again, by varying the parameters, you'll get different rates of, uh, of convergence. So this is great and all for um, kind of uh, as a setup for kind of minimizing uh, the error rate in a, given, in a given curve, but now we want to use it instead to perhaps uh, fit a linear regression model. So here, uh, because this curve is kind of like a, a one-dimensional thing, we're really only trying to like optimize that single value um, or that value of x, whereas here what we want to do is uh, set it up to find a line through this point. So this is just awesome, again, toy data, so it's like a cricket data set cricket chirp sound data set. So not to be confused with cricket the sport, but yeah, so striped ground crickets will chirp at a certain frequency that seems to have some dependency on temperature. Um, I guess far fewer uh, chirps per second when it's a bit colder and um, greater amounts of chirping when it's a bit hotter. So temperature here is on this axis and how many times per second they'll chirp. On this y axis, we see some kind of we can interpret some kind of relationship here, but we actually want to learn the parameters of the line of best fit. So in this case, we know that the line of best fit has this general form. So um, basically like a, a bias value, um, your, your intercept and uh, this like slope value, this uh, that, that defines the line uh, through X. And so uh, this is kind of the math that will be, you'll see in the, the textbook, but this is your, what we want to minimize. This is our loss function. So whenever we, um, whenever a new value is given to us in that uh, equation that we care about, we want uh, the difference between it and the actual value when squared and averaged over all sets to be as small as possible. Like if we, if this was set effectively zero, we would have a perfect model. Um, and so we need to, in this case, we're learning two parameters. So uh, theta zero and theta one. So we need to take the derivatives with respect to each. So then we get um, these functions, and in a similar way to uh, above, we just set up these things as, as lambdas, right? So um, this is our function that we care about. This is uh, basically um, our loss function, and then we want to minimize it. So we want the gradient, we want the derivative of that loss function. So again, these are, What's, you don't normally have to do these types of things um, when doing like conventional machine learning because a lot of these things are built into the packages and libraries that will already be used. But uh, the beauty to kind of implementing it yourself is to get that understanding, that intuition as to what's really going under, like going on underneath the hood. And so this sets up in kind of a, a more complex way as above, but more or less the same thing. Um, we have an old, uh, old thetas, both initialized to zero, and we have new thetas. Um, in this case, our, our starting point will be at uh, the points one, one. We have a certain step size, a certain precision. We'll keep track of the number of steps. Um, we just uh, set this to an arbitrary large value at the beginning. And again, a delay, this is just a visualization um, element. And so the beauty here is uh, we, we will hopefully see that we get a line of best fit based on the parameters that we learn kind of in a, in a stepwise manner. So here, um, again, this is gradient descent set up for, um, for this problem. And this is all introductory visualization stuff. And I'll, I'll toggle this, actually I'll, uh, I'll keep it in for now. Um, but you'll see from this process, within a few steps, we're getting very, very close. So what I'm doing is I'm plotting the line each time um, this updates and you can see that uh, 45 iterations in we're getting to a pretty close value of x but our um, our model is kind of like jittering around like that those those two parameters are now being kind of like toyed around with each time trying to get them slightly closer so the bias value might be increased slightly the slope might be tilted slightly and with every one of those iterations it's moving hopefully in the, the, the direction it, towards the, that minimizing, um, those minimizing values. But you can see that now we're about 150 in. These are like very, very small changes that are happening right now. Like the error on the function 
um, is in fact taking a long time to get to that precision value that we care about, right? Like this difference is, is massive. And that's why I don't want to plot everything the entire time and then let this run to completion, but get a sense for the amount of time that this takes. Um, like my hint here is that this converges around half a million. So there's half a million steps of this um, batch. The way that we've implemented this batch gradient descent, um, you can tell it's taking like a, a pretty long time. And this is a very small data set. I think we have like 15 data points. Um, but yeah, eventually it will get there. I think it's some like 30, yeah, 30 some seconds in. But yeah, it took about, yeah, five, 565,000 some steps to converge, but we can see what the values of theta zero, your um, bias uh, value and your slope value and see what they are. And um, so what we'll do here as a comparison is let's actually look. So we implemented this ourselves. These are the values that we got. And let's see um, how the actual linear regression uh, algorithm from the stats library. Let's see how well it or, or what values it actually um, prints out. So when we uh, put in our X and Y values, we can get the intercept value and we can get the slope value. And so we can compare these two. We can see that the actual linear regression model got to uh, 25.23 sum, whereas at 25,129. The theta one in this case. 3.29, here we're pretty, pretty close, 3.29. So, um, but do notice how, how much quicker <laughs> this was, right? Uh, to learn this model, this was like uh, a fraction of a second. Um, so there's a pretty big difference in the way that we've implemented these two things, even though they essentially do the same thing. Uh, and so if you look at the actual source code, like we, we, uh, for the sake of time, I won't dig into it too deeply, but you can see that um, one of the tricks that it uses is the covariance of X and Y as a bit more of a, a rapid way to compute what that next parameter is. Um, and something that's kind of like important here is just uh, realizing that uh, any of these like software engineering or like algorithmic tricks that you can do to really speed up the computation of uh, your machine learning um, models, not just the models, but like the, the training of the models to get them to converge rapidly to those optimal values. Um, those are all like very valuable and like important to know about. So as kind of like optional homework, so this was like batch gradient descent. Um, I'll introduce the idea here of mini batch gradient descent. So um, to allow it to converge faster, this is like homework left to you guys to figure out. Like it should be pretty straightforward how you might set that up given um, these things uh, set up for you guys, but it's basically a variation on gradient descent, where instead of using like all the data every time to compute the error and then set up the next step, we it, the data are instead split up into what are called like mini batches. Um, so instead you uh, calculate the error on like a random subsample of those data points to then update the parameter. Because our data set was so small, we had like 15 points. Um, it doesn't necessarily make sense, but it is uh, very useful when you get into much larger data sets. Um, because if you have millions of data points and you have to compute millions of error parameters uh, based on their residuals, that can take a long time. So I'll let you guys contemplate that and work towards that. Um, another variant of gradient descent is stochastic gradient descent. So um, much as inspired by the idea of mini batch, um, if, if in batch gradient descent, we have to look at the entire training set on every step, it's very slow and um, basically intractable for very large data sets. So in contrast, stochastic gradient descent will update our values after looking at each of them. Every single one evaluated, we slightly tune the parameters. Um, and the intuition here, the idea is that we can start making progress on our model right away without having to consider calculating the errors over all, um, you know, in this case, 15 data points, but if you had millions, we wouldn't have to wait to calculate the error on all those million. Um, so this is just like a recall what stochastic gradient descent is. Um, and uh, what we do is we basically like randomly shuffle the data set. This is kind of the same initial setup. So I'd, I'd invite you guys to like read through kind of all of this and the setup. Um, and so what we're doing now is we'll actually implement it, but instead of using just those 15 data points, we'll do it on um, kind of like a simulated uh, set of like thousands of, or and I think we used half a million, half a million points. 
so let's see. Typically, we'll run through. Yeah, so typically with stochastic gradient descent, we'll only we'll have to run through the entire data set about 10 times. And this is instead of running through the entire data set uh, half a million times as we had to do with batch gradient descent. But then what we're going to do is iterate in each of those 10 iterations through the entire data set. We'll update the parameters every time we have um, a measure of error for every data point. So unlike gradient descent, we'll tend to oscillate near a minimum. Uh, so because stochastic gradient descent in some sense is a bit noisier, or well, it's stochastic in nature uh, because we're randomly selecting which data point to consider, um, it may not always converge super well. So similar to that idea of before, uh, we want to decay perhaps the step size as we go further and further into the algorithm. So uh, here, basically, we'll generate half a million points, and it's going to be around this value. So, so it's going to be noise added to this curve, 2x plus 17. So this 2 value is the one that we hope to approximate. The 17 is the one that we hope to approximate. Um, and so if we uh, generate all of this, so we're adding, in this case, some amount of randomized noise, this is basically what it looks like. So we're trying to learn the line of best fit, which we, we know we've generated data samples around it, and we're going to see how well from, uh, from our gradient descent implementation can we get to approximating those two values based on this data that was generated with random noise. Um, in this case, because it's randomly generated data, it doesn't really mean much to shuffle things, but uh, it's a good practice in general uh, to kind of shuffle your data set in advance. Um, especially if, it, if you're not sure where the source of the data comes from. So that's all that this does is just like set up two shuffled sets uh, and uh, randomly, randomly combines them. And then this is similar to the setup from before. So we want to set up um, our equation for our line. In this case, we're going to be calculating cost. So instead of calculate, calculating loss after each iteration, right, we had a, a loss value. We'll instead look at cost, and the cost is, um, or the cost function is simply calculated as the average of loss functions. So we're going to, I think I say it here, every uh, 10,000 steps, we'll just get the average cost from the losses measured over those previous 10,000 steps. And those 10,000 steps in this case are the uh, 10,000 samples that we're looking at, um, not 10, 000, not the 10 passes over the entire data set. So yeah, we run through the entire list 10 times. Um, and again, to distinguish that from before where we had to go through like half a million, which with uh, batch gradient descent. So similar setup as most others, um, old theta values and, and new theta values. Uh, our step size in this case is, is really small. Um, what do I have here? Number plot for faster. Yeah, so I'm, I'm also as I've done before, I'm going to try and like plot to show to see what's going on, but there's half a million points and plotting half a million points does take like a, a couple milli, like milliseconds. So, so I'm only going to do a subset on that just so that the visualization of it uh, looks a bit better. But here we're basically saying let's iterate through the data set 10 times. Uh, and then for each of the data points in M in this case is just the, the number of points in our data set. Uh, so in this case, the five. Uh, 100,000 that we generated. Um, all that we're doing is uh, we're incrementing the number of iterations that we're on, uh, setting back uh, the uh, whatever previous values we had into the old values, and then we're setting up the new values much as we've done before. So this, again, is the heart of our um, stochastic gradient descent. And then all that this is is uh, for the cost, both for plotting the the uh, curve at this given point in time, and also um, if we're on our 10,000th step, we're going to measure what the cost over those previous sets are. So all that all that is is we're appending um, the loss each time, or like we're keeping track of the sum of the cost. So that's that's what this is. And then if it's the 10,000th step, we just divide that by 10,000 to get the average of that cost over that period of time. And then at the end of it all, we plot out what our our values are. So that will look. Oh, cost is not defined. Sorry, I guess I missed running this cell. Okay, so that will look something like, what do I have now? Cost is not defined. 
I had these working before. Okay, here we go. So you can see um, our we're on iteration zero, but every time we're so right now we've already looked at like in this case uh, four hundred thousand data points, and our cost is going down. And what you can kind of see so this is it's a bit um, like. Uh, uh, finicky because it's like clearing and replotting every time. This looked even worse when you try to do um, all half a million points. What you can hopefully see here is the line is kind of like jittering around. So it's like we're seeing the slope being slightly modified. Here the intercept is like it, uh, it gets very uh, pretty slowly, but it slowly like rises a little more. It's like it will rise the, uh, the intercept a little and then it will kind of like jitter around the slope and then it will maybe like toy around with the the, uh, the intercept again and so we're on like iteration four of our data set um, eventually it gets through all ten and we end up with uh, with our cost function and I guess I can't let the other cells run um, we'll let this kind of like run through to completion but then I'll show you kind of what what we can expect is uh, so then if we plot the cost over all those uh, in this case we go over like five hundred thousand uh, iterations, um, you can see it, it rapidly declines to around a uh, value of like maybe fifty forty nine, but then it, it basically is just like noisy around uh, that point. So we could say that within the first I guess uh, hundred thousand iterations we basically converge to as good a value as we were more or less going to get. Um, because we see very minimal uh, improvement or like reduction in costs uh, well past that. So we're on to eight. So you can see like the cost value here is kind of like, it's around those values. It's like uh, 50, 49, 50. We plot at the end, I think the, the minimum value. So, and we want to see what those values of, of theta are. So just as a reminder, um, one value is 17, the other is two, and we know that from our equation. So when we see the minimum cost that we had over the course was, uh, was 49, and that uh, 16.955 was our model's, um, I guess, like minimized uh, um, estimation of the value of 17, and 1.996 is what its estimated value of, of two is. And so what we do is we basically just like plot that out, uh, because we're generating, in this case, new data every time, we get slightly different uh, curves. Um, does anyone, I'll like throw this out as a question, so like you can't really see it, but there's like a kind of like uh, intervals of 10, there's like 10 regular peaks. Does anyone have an idea as to why that might be the case? I'll like throw this out, either unmute or throw uh, your answer into the chat. What is the like significance of the value 10 in, in this case? Yeah, iterations. Well, so thanks, Stefan. So the iterations in this case here, we took 10 iterations through our data set, but we don't shuffle the data set every time. So it's kind of taking the same, every time we start a new iteration, we're considering the same um, order of, uh, of data points each time. So what would this mean is that whenever there's like kind of a spike in the cost function, you're looking at uh, data points that are perhaps like harder or um, less useful to the model um, model uh, parameter uh, optimization. So what ends up happening is those uh, less useful points typically cause spikes. And so you can see some regularity of spikes because every time we hit a new iteration, we're, we're basically um, hitting those points again. Uh, and so all that to say, this is kind of what things look like at the end. So this is all the data. This is our line of best fit. And I mean, we know we did decently well. Um, and so that is stochastic gradient descent. Um, here are all the takeaway messages more or less from this. I'd suggest, um, again, as always, uh, just like focusing in on kind of the, the key points of each of these throughout. And I'd also highly recommend um, trying this out for yourselves, implementing mini batch instead of, so we've looked at batch, we've looked at stochastic, mini batch is, um, it's just like another variant. Uh, and if you do so, feel free to like message me your solutions. Is iterations here equal to epoch? Um, in it, the epochs in this case would be the value of 10. It, it, it can be thought of as epochs. It's just an epoch will normally, 
um, be based on a batch. So if we look at um, at mini batch, or if we look at batch gradient descent, an epoch is one cycle through all the data. If we look at a mini batch, um, an epoch would be uh, you know like one error estimation on uh, the data here because we're doing this for every single point. Um, it's you can call either these ten epochs or you could call each one of these perhaps an epoch as well. Um, it's it's just like defined based on the um, on the uh, type of stochastic or the type of gradient descent that you consider. I hope that answers your question. Um, since we're getting pretty close to the end, I'm just going to briefly introduce uh, the second tutorial. So this one is on uh, data imputation instead. Um, and I'll like just go through like the general premise. It's a pretty short notebook. So um, in essence, uh, what we want to do is simulate the process of like, filling in missing data with imputed values. Um, and so basically we want to then just like train a classifier uh, on those imputed values versus oops, versus one where the rows are just removed altogether. So the like kind of experiment here is um, is it better to impute values or to remove uh, like samples that have missing values altogether? So the goal or the uh, general process here will be loading the iris data set. We'll split it into a train test 50-50 split. And then what we'll do is we'll iterate through a number of different uh, percentages of uh, imputed or like simulated removal of values. We'll start at 10%, we'll go in steps of 10 up to a maximum of 70%. And so for each of those, we're going to remove uh, I percent of the training data from one of the features. We're going to impute it using the mean of all the other features. We'll train a classifier, we'll test the classifier, and report the score um, of I. And then that's like the imputed condition. And the removal condition will be, instead of imputing those values, we'll just uh, re replace them or remove them uh, as uh, non-existent values, train the classifier, test the classifier, and report the score. Um, so here is basically just like a uh, um, acquisition of the data set. So it's just the, the iris data set as before. So we have the four features here, which um, correspond to petal um, dimensions. Uh, and to simplify this, we're just going to consider one of these um, features. We'll just consider like the sepal width um, in, in centimeters. So here we just drop the three others. Uh, and we'll get like a brief summary uh, statistics of it. So you can see it's, um, we have 150 points. The mean value over all points is, is this and so on and so forth. Um, this is a pair plot just to show like which of the features that we have, but there's no uh, second or third or additional features. So we really only just get like the one histogram, but this is basically those values um, of sepal width based on the class um, that they, they belong to. So quite a, quite a bit of overlap. Um, and to avoid data leakage, this is something that I don't think has been not necessarily touched on um, before. Uh, why would we want to split the data set before we impute the values? Um, so data leakage, and you can like click on this link, which I think has a, a wiki article on it or, or a Kaggle article, um, is basically when test samples will somehow uh, encode or information about the test samples are somehow encoded within the training data set. So there's like some information from our independent data set that in fact is not so independent. Um, so the idea here is if we use uh, some of the values from our uh, test set to impute values from our training set, it's uh, like a subtle form of data leakage. We're using information about that independent set um, and encoding it within the, uh, the training set. So this is just a, a concept that is important to keep in mind when setting up machine uh, learning problems. Um, but really all that we're gonna do here first is set it up, um, split it into the training set and the test set uh, by 50%. And then this is where we actually run the experiment. So this is like a bit to take in, but in essence we're randomly, so for each of the fractions, I think this one, I said we were gonna do this too. 70%. So um, we're going to uh, select a number of missing rows by the fraction that we want. So we're just sampling out a random set. Um, and then we're, we're going through the process of kind of like setting up our experiment. We want to replace those with uh, NAN, so missing simulated data. So we're saying wherever, if 
find within our copy of the training set those uh, those at the indices of the missing rows in the column sepal width centimeter make that equal to NAN. So instead of the actual value, set it to, to this non-existent number. Um, and then similarly, uh, our no uh, NA, so this is like our dropping uh, criteria, we're saying um, let's remove those uh, uh, rows before, to, before we uh, set up the mean. So then all that this does is we're setting um, for each class, we're finding uh, all the other values that, uh, that we have for imputation. Let's get the means of all those and set that uh, into, the, into the value. And then we're basically um, replacing amongst each of those. Because because this is three class, we just have to like, it's a bit verbose to set it up this way, but we have to um, basically uh, uh, replace the mean value with the mean for that actual class. So that's, so we computed the mean. Here we're setting the means. Then we uh, set this up for actual uh, a classification problem. So we extract the features. In this case, there's just one set of features, the sepal width in centimeters. The labels are the class labels. So we want to uh, pass both of those to our classifier. So here we train the decision tree classifier on our test set. We apply it, and this is the case with imputation. Um, and then we do the same for the ones without the imputation. So the, the values were simply removed altogether. Um, and so we get a score for the imputation case and we get a score for the no imputation case. And then we're just going to print out the results for each of those. And this goes pretty quickly. I've also plotted out the differences between the two. So as you can see, um, the imp for 10% of the data, whether we impute or not doesn't really change. For 20% doesn't really change. In fact, there's really only two conditions where 50% um, and 60% of the data um, that were, were sampled when removed, there's a slight difference. So um, we have a higher value. So 5.5 five versus 5.3 and 6.0 versus 5.5 five, five, um, in these cases. So really it's not, it's not a huge difference, but it is still a difference. So I guess like the, the takeaways here, um, well, I'll leave them down at the bottom since we're coming close to the end. Um, but basically, uh, the takeaways are that you can impute the values. If you can impute the values, it, it might be worth doing so. Um, there's a couple questions I'll leave to you guys to, to consider, like what happens if you have uh, feature data that's missing from the test set, um, and how would you impute those within the test set? Um, and uh, Something that I'll leave also as open-ended applied type homework uh, as before. Um, in this case, you kind of have everything set up to, uh, to run this kind of experiment. Uh, all that one would need to do is figure out a different strategy kind of here in the middle for how you want to come up with whatever value it is you're going to fill in those missing data for. And there are, um, within the machine learning, like the, the chapter, like the subsection on data imputation, um, there are several other types of ways that you can impute values. Uh, and so something that maybe as like, again, open-ended, more research type questions, if you were asked to kind of like figure out the best way or a better way to impute values uh, for part of a, a given problem that you're working on, um, it would be interesting to try and like compare those and see if one indeed does have a statistically significant improvement over dropping samples altogether, right? You can always drop the samples as a, as a um, like the most simplest form. Um, is mean imputation the best? Perhaps, perhaps not. And I mean, as we saw in most cases, it, it won't make much of a difference, but in some cases it would. Um, so, uh, and, and what happens in other cases when you say, for example, have multiple features, and can you impute the value of a missing feature using other features? Uh, so this is kind of touched upon in the, in the book and the more that you kind of like read into this um, and these like different types of techniques, it's, it's valuable to spend a bit of time working on those. And other than that, I'll leave uh, just a few minutes here at the end. If anybody has any um, questions about anything, I know we kind of rushed through this data set pretty quickly, but I think it's pretty straightforward to work through. Um, does anyone have any questions, comments, things you want to see in future tutorials? I know it's a lot of me just like talking at you guys, but unless you guys uh, <laughs> throw questions at me, I'm just going to keep talking.
If not, uh, all good. I'll uh, make sure to put an updated version. I, I modified the slides slightly. Um, I'll make sure to throw that into uh, everything's all part of the GitHub repo. But yeah, without uh, any other questions or anything that's unclear, I think we'll just call it at that. Thanks for coming. Hope that this was instructive. All the best in the gradient ascent of one's grades in this course. Really bad puns, but <laughs> got to keep it fun. All right. Sounds good. See you guys. Take care.